Good evening, everyone. My name is Michael Zank. I'm the director of the Elie Wiesel Center for Jewish Studies. And I welcome you to the second annual Elie Wiesel Memorial Lectures at Boston University. Hearing your feedback we had from last year, I will uh, pick up on one thing that was very important and several people said, which was keep the introductions short. <laughs> I will do you the favor and myself the favor of saying very little, in part because we have two remarkable men with us tonight who uh, will have a conversation and will allow us to be present for this conversation. And uh, I know both of these men now. Uh, one I only met today, the other one I've met for many years since I came to BU, it is a long time ago, in 1994, as a young adjunct, maybe not so young, adjunct uh, professor of uh, Jewish studies. He was the rabbi here at Boston University at the Hillel House and the chaplain of the university. Um, and I don't think I, introducing somebody who's new to most of you, I think uh, from everybody who came up earlier and said hello to Rabbi Pollock, I think you all know him already. So uh, I want to welcome Rabbi Pollock back here at BU. He, is, he has been here, but welcome back to a very visible place, and I, I'm so glad you're with us tonight. <laughs> Rabbi Pollack, in his recent book, uh, described that it took him a long time to write about his experiences and what these experiences meant for him. Writing from a place of survival is the theme of our series this fall. And we chose this title because to us it represents something that Elie Wiesel represented. Professor Wiesel once told me that he wrote every day. And I put this together with another comment that uh, Marion, his wife, now widow, made at the time, which is they were partners in everything except for the writing, which to me suggests that Elie Wiesel wrote alone. He was a very social person, as our second guest tonight can also attest. Dr. Hank Knight, a accomplished theologian, also a longtime university chaplain, had very life-changing experiences with Elie Wiesel, one of the wonderful things he told me earlier was that when they first really spent time together, what they, what they did was they sang. They were in a car for two hours and, and Hank Knight sang a song and then Elie Wiesel sang a song and then Hank Knight sang another song. And this is such a deep social experience. But when he wrote, he did it for himself. It was part of his life as a survivor. He wrote from a place, as we all know, from survival. There are many traumas, many things we, if we come away from them and survive them, they will haunt us for the rest of our lives. And to find words and to give others a chance to read those words and to think about it and to participate and to think more deeply of what it means to be human, that's what it is to write from a place of survival. And I'm very grateful that uh, Rabbi Pollack is with us to, tonight to speak about the process that it took him to write this book and to speak about his own experience, which is a very unusual one. Or maybe not so unusual. Maybe there are many who were in that situation, child survivors, who, on t in addition to the challenges of their experience, had to live with the realization that their own memories were always doubted by others who thought they knew better, which makes writing about this experience even more complicated. And I read this book, Prof. Uh, Dr. Uh, Rabbi Pollack's book this summer, and I was struck. The book struck me as a kind of archaeology. You know, when 
somewhere in the Middle East, you have a mound, you know there is a city hidden there. But archaeologists don't know where the gate was to the city. And so they do these little probes. They dig this way, they dig another way, they dig another way to figure out the shape of what they're looking for. They know there is something here, but they don't know what shape it has. This is what that book seems to be doing. It probes, it goes from many directions, it uses many ways to probe something that is, in a way, too difficult really to talk about. Rabbi Pollack will be in conversation with Professor Dr. Hank Knight, who for many years was a university chaplain. He has an own, his own story to tell. It's a very interesting story. And what he's been doing for the last 10 or 12 years was he ran a center for Holocaust and genocide studies at Keene State University in New Hampshire. And this is the model for our own BU program in Holocaust, genocide, and human rights study. So those of you students in that program will maybe have a chance afterwards to ask him questions about what that program does, how it works, and what our program here could do. So right now, I just want to stop and invite these two gentlemen on the stage, and I'm really looking forward to their conversation tonight. I think the first thing I've noticed is I need to lose some weight. Uh, <laughs> this is a close fit. <laughs> Rabbi Pollock, it is a delight, actually an honor for me to be in a conversation with you. I, I, read, I read your book and Available found it, on Amazon. <laughs> it looks like this. And, and it, it was one of the most powerful reads uh, I've had in a long, long time. And I thought a, a, a fair amount about how to begin a conversation with you. And, and I, th like most academics, um, I've cheated and written my thoughts, um, but I think in the interest of it being a conversation, I'm going to turn this down, and I'm not going to refer to it. But I'm going to try to remember uh, how I wanted us to begin. I was struck by your reminding your readers that after is not over in the context of the Holocaust. And in, in this particularly slim volume, you have artfully, carefully, and very sensitively crafted a narrative that is is not simply a recounting of what happened. There's some recounting to help us locate you and your experience and to locate ourselves in relationship to that. But I, I, I can only think of your book as a way of bearing witness. And it is a, a way of bearing witness that relies on the percussive metaphors of sound. And I, I'm struck by how your reference to the ring of the bell that would accompany a typewriter reaching the end of a margin in a 
return to begin a new line and continue a list. And a reminder that a list is much more than a list in your narrative. Or that the ringing of a doorbell is something much more than being alerted that you have a visitor at your front door. It has echoes of great power and discomfort. And that the ringing of a bell could be very much like a church bell, but not simply announcing uh, a worship service, but signaling a reminder that of what Raoul Hilberg uh, observed, no church, no Holocaust. And for somebody like me, who's an ordained Christian clergy person, those are, that's unsettling in, in a profound kind of way. And so what I would like to do is ask, as, as you set about the task of bearing witness, can you take us back to the threshold of this project? What, what were you considering as you realized you had something very important to share, but how you shared it was, was clearly something that was part of your consciousness as you set about the task of writing. Can, can you take us back to that threshold? There is a story that happened to me, uh, which uh, is not in the book, Maybe it is. I don't remember. Um, and um, I am in Montreal. It is winter uh, 1948 uh, onto 49. I came, I came to Canada in December 48. Uh, and so I, and I'm immediately sent to a public school in Montreal called the Bancroft School, which is no longer there, needless to say. Uh, and I'm in, I'm in the school, and I don't speak a word of English. And uh, there was this teacher there was this teacher uh, whose name was Mrs. George. Don't ask me how I remember these things. <laughs> and Mrs. George was peculiar that she wore a tie every day. Uh, she was a very good, very firm, grade one teacher. And like all um, mature, firm women, I loved her from the day I met her. But things happened in the classroom, and I had to go to the bathroom. And I didn't speak a word of English. So I said to her in my best Dutch, I need to go to the bathroom. And she looked at me and smiled and said, what the heck is this kid saying? So then I pointed to where you go to the bathroom, and she instantly understood my need. And she had a student take me to the bathroom. Uh, which uh, was particularly gracious of her because to this very day, uh, I don't find places without my uh, iPhone, you know, it's so. Uh, and she, uh, so I go to the bathroom and the kid that brought me there wasn't that smart because he immediately went back to class. <laughs> so I come out of the bathroom and I'm lost. And Baron Bing is like the Empire State Building. I mean, you know, all four floors of it. And, and I was completely lost. 
So I went over to this mature looking woman and everybody in those days wore school uniforms. Uh, so they're all dressed alike. So I could never find that person again if I ever wanted to. Um, and I thought she was like an old lady, but she turned out to be in grade seven. <laughs> and she, I, and I said to her that uh, I was in room 18, no, room 19, I think it was, room 19, and I was lost. So she took my hand, brought me to room 19, and that's, now you want to know why I'm telling the story? Uh, I'll tell you exactly why I'm telling the story. Because I go home, and I said to my mother, I said to my mother, uh, guess what? I spoke English today. She said, you don't know any English. <laughs> I told her the whole story. I had to go to the bathroom. And when I, when I came out, I saw this older woman. And I said that I need to get back to my class. And I told, and she said, what room are you in? And I told her in perfect English what room I was in. And she brought me back. My mother says, what did you say that made her bring you back? I said, Zimmer Neunzen, <laughs> which is German. She said, you don't know any English. And what you said, what you said was room 19 in German. I said, well, you say I don't know any English, but I say I don't know any German. <laughs> and she said, yes, you do. And the thing that you know best is how to count in German. Because every morning, and she's crying when she's telling me the story, every morning, she, uh, every morning, there was an SS guard that came to my mother's cabin. My mother couldn't walk, um, was too weak to go to the Appell, and um, brought me to the Appell plots where they were counting uh, where the Jews counted off basically every morning. And uh, I am saying, uh, I, I am on his shoulders. I am on his shoulders. And my mother said that every morning when you came back from the Appell Platz, and she always added, and I never knew if you would come back. Um, but when you came back from the Appell Platz, you amused yourself by saying, eins, zwei, drei, vier, fünf, Zex and so on. And so that's how you learn to count in German. And so last week, last week, uh, I went on a journey of remembrance with my two sons, one of whom is in his 50s, the other is in his 30s, to um, to, uh, to Bergen-Belsen, and to Trobitz, and to Auschwitz. And my younger son is a very vigorous athlete, and he's big in Muay Thai. And I said, since I'm being a father on this trip, he, like, he, he cannot go without a day or two without doing his Muay Thai. Uh, vigorous, it's a, it's a, uh, a self-defense kind of a, uh, athletic uh, thing. And so I went with him to the gym in, where were we? Um, Hanover, which is near the biggest airport near Bergen-Belsen. And I went with him to the gym to see the most rigorous uh, one and a half hour gym class I've ever seen in my life of people kicking and boxing and, and running and very powerful. But the leader of the class was a very smart, shrewd coach, gym coach. And when you do exercises, right? You, do, you, you, you put your right hand out, and you count to five. 
And he's saying, eins, zwei, drei, vier. I had to leave. I had to leave. I couldn't bear it. He wasn't a Nazi. He was a terrific coach. I couldn't sit there, and I couldn't bear it, and I found myself crying. So that's the answer to your question about <laughs> percussion. Sorry it took so long, but, uh, but that, that's, that's percussion mm -hmm. is what's inside of me. I don't have visual memories. I have two or three visual memories, some of which I read about in the book. I had another one. <laughs> I have another one that I had since I wrote the book, which I, which, uh, I don't know why it came to me, but it came to me. Uh, and, but but the, the, the non-visual memories are all acoustic. They're all about sounds that, and sounds, you know, are not just in your ears. Your whole body hears sounds and, and takes in sounds. And that's why the book is so obsessed. That's the way I remember as a reader, uh, I, was, I was struck by this visceral um, dimension and, and felt like um, that really set your memoir apart in a very distinctive way. And one of the things that you helped me, uh, you helped me with was th thinking about the role of someone who wasn't there being guided by your tracing experiences through these visceral memories because they're precognitive. And, and you were finding a way to reconstruct and build a pathway that someone like me who has no access to that, can follow. And it, it makes for a very profound um, uh, experience for someone trying to understand, follow, who needs to ha have a guide to, the, to as much of a threshold as one can make. Um, and I'm not sure there's a question in that, as much as um, a way of saying um, what you did with the acoustics helped someone like me who um, has no other way to, to look at this history than through the helping hand of a vulnerable guide. So let me respond to that and and tell you about a memory where I obviously have a visual memory, but that's connected uh, to, to the acoustical side of things. And then I want to add something else. Uh, the first thing is that I'm six years old. We've just come across the ocean in 48, December 48, to New York, take the train, to Montreal, uh, my mother's passport, which I still have, still has the stamp of Rouse's Point, which is where is still today, where the, where the one of the major rail crossings. And we get to Montreal, we move in with my grandmother. I describe all this in the book, and my uncle who lived with her. My grandmother was a widow, and. Uh, and I, I would say within a week, they hire Reverend Ronas to teach me to read Hebrew. Now, why do I need to learn Hebrew? Well, a Jew needs to know Hebrew, fine. But I had an urgency because I had to say Kaddish. So you gotta be able to read Hebrew. Uh, and I would say within a couple of weeks, I am off to the synagogue, to the six o'clock minion every morning, and I say Kaddish. Kaddish in this particular synagogue was 
all the Kaddish sayers, anybody who had a reason to say Kaddish, would go to the front of the synagogue and there would be a kind of a sideways pew, uh, 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 a, not a pew, a, uh, a line, a lineup of people, and you said Kaddish together. So it was kind of, you know, eight, nine guys in a, in a room with 30 people saying Kaddish. And I was a kid, six years old, saying Kaddish with them. And there are a couple of things about that. But there was in that saying of Kaddish something very reassuring for me, something very soothing for me, while at the same time being terrifying. It was soothing because of the the music of it. It wasn't sung, but because it was said together, the same phrases in the same way, we're talking about the acoustics <laughs> of the Holocaust. That's, that's the acoustics of the Holocaust. It was terrifying because I didn't know who the hell I was saying Kaddish for. I don't remember the guy. And for this, I have to get up every morning at 6 o'clock and, why, and I missed him, and I longed for him, and I wanted him. Where was he? Well, he was dead. What does dead mean? Like, you know, when you're six years old, you don't know from dead. I just knew that he wasn't there, and that was terrible. But, but what stays with me, I can go back to that shul to that synagogue and to that Kaddish as if it were yesterday. I mean, the, the vividness of it. I remember the faces in the line with me. We're talking 1949 now, winter 1949. I remember everything about it, the room, the people, some of the names, um, and um, the other thing that I want to I want to say about it is is that after I completed the book, I had another memory uh, that uh, I certainly would have written about it had I remembered it then, but I, it didn't come to me. But then it did. We are in a small village in Germany near the Polish border. Our train is hurtling out of Bergen-Belsen on the way to Theresienstadt. And it is liberated by the Russians. We're in this little town, village. Uh, the train has about 2,500 people on it. The people on the train are dying in vast numbers every single day. The, um, the train uh, is strafed by American uh, airplanes who think it's a German troop train. People die that way. And the tr whenever the train stops, which is quite often, uh, the main activity of, uh, of the uh, stops is to bury the dead. People are uh, dying of hunger at, 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 at impossible numbers. You have to understand that uh, my mother at that time, uh, who normally weighed 120 pounds or so, weighed 50 pounds. So you have an, some sense <coughs> and, um, of, of, of who, who we're dealing, who's on this train. My mother is on this train. My father's on this train. Uh, I have some memory of the train, but not enough to tell you anything about it. But we finally are liberated in this small village called Trebitz, almost on the Polish border, by the Russians. <coughs> My father, uh, who had typhus worse than my mother, is taken to a kind of troop barracks 
that they had in, uh, in um, Trovitz. And there he dies. Um, what I remembered was, and, and my mother is hallucinating like uh, you wouldn't believe, completely out of control. Her voice was like this, acoustics of the Holocaust. She was a soprano and a very good one. Um, and she was nuts. Uh, from the fever, from everything. And some woman, I'm remembering this, you know, 70 years later, some woman comes over to me to tell me that my father died. Must have been a social worker, it must have been a, a, a doctor or a nurse from the Soviet army, I don't know who it was. I had no idea what she was talking about. But I was so devastated. I'm two and a half. I was so devastated by what she said that what I do remember is not the sound of her voice, but the power of her message. I don't think I've ever been moved in my entire life. By, by, by a message as powerful to that. I did not know what dead meant. I, if you would ask me, Pollock, define dead, I couldn't tell you. But when they said, in this serious way, I had to know, she needed me to know somehow. You know, and I can imagine, they met, and she, do we tell the kid or do we not tell the kid? And they met, and, and I don't know who she is, who she was, but I remember um, what, what seems to me to be an abyss, and that I was somewhere in that abyss, that there's something, the most horrible thing that could ever happen had just happened. But, and I remember that, I remember the feeling, and I remember the, so that's, that didn't make it into the book, so. Those are, those are moments of being summoned into a, a kind of presence that you don't yet understand, I, I would think. I, I'm, I keep thinking about um, it somehow there's an unarticulated here a shema, but in a really, not in, the, in a negative kind of reversal of what, what that's all about. It's a, it's a calling uh, a, that reaches into yourself and, and addresses you even now. But, I mean, Rabbi, when you, when you describe this, you you take me to those moments. My guess is the people in this room have some sense of being taken at, at least close to those moments. And um, there's a sense of the appropriate response for someone like me listening is to say, here I am. I'm, I'm I'm paying as close attention, as responsive and responsible attention as I possibly can. Um, it, it, that's not what one normally experiences in reading a memoir. The word Let's, let's go back. I'm, I'm responding to you. Uh, it may not sound like it, that's all. Um, I trust you. OK. Uh, the word is this. There's a word, and I, 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 there's another book 
that I'm working on where this is going to be a very serious issue. Uh, it's not sufficiently in that book. But let's go back to the Adas Yashurin Synagogue in Montreal, where I'm a six-year-old saying Kaddish. You know, I must have said Kaddish for a year or whatever. I don't remember. Now listen to me carefully. I was six years old. You don't hear children saying Kaddish, right? <laughs> when you go to the synagogue, the people who say Kaddish are people who have immediate relatives who died. Who has immediate relatives who die? Grown-ups, right? So here is this um, horribly pale moi, um, six-year-old. You, you could tell me from all the kids in the room, I had the worst, my mother said, I had the worst case of jaundice in all of Bergen-Belsen. And it stayed with me till I was 13 or 14. I was always pale, like you thought I was going to die in 20 minutes. Um, uh, and, uh, and I'm saying Kaddish. Six-year-old kid is saying Kaddish with all these grown-ups. And I have a good voice, and I said it loud like everybody else. So you're going to hear me, acoustics of the Holocaust. You're going to hear me. In that entire year, friends, in that entire year, not a single man, woman, or whatever in that synagogue came over to me and asked me, who are you saying Kaddish for? And that introduces uh, the word that's not in the book enough. And that is that the primary, primary, primary characteristic of the survivor is that he has been, she has been humiliated beyond what you can ever imagine humiliation can mean. Not having a daddy is embarrassing. Do you understand? Everybody, what? What? Everybody has a daddy. I didn't have, Joseph didn't have a daddy. Where's your daddy? Dead. What's dead? Like, I know what dead was. And it is the gross humiliation of the survivor that has not been attended to enough in trying to understand what the Germans were doing. Every once in a while, I pick up the Warsaw Diary of Rabbi Shimon Huberband, who was part of, if you know what this is, the Einig Shabbos group in the, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto, group of very dedicated religious and non-religious Jews uh, who wrote descriptions, very fine, finely honed and thoughtful descriptions of life in the ghetto. And Rabbi Huberband writes about uh, the Germans cutting the beards off the Jews in the ghetto. It was a requirement. You could no longer, if you wore a beard, you could no longer wear it uh, in the ghetto. This was true in most of the, uh, of the ghettos. 
and it was true in Warsaw, and Huberman describes it. But as a side note, as a side note, not his main thrust of his writing, what does he say? He describes the German cutting the hair off the face of this Jew, and the, 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 the scissors wasn't very good, so he's cutting into his skin at the same time. And it's a horrible, horrible scene. For me, that wasn't the interesting part. The interesting part, Huberman, Hu, Huberman writes, he doesn't say it's the interesting part. For me, it was the interesting part. Huberman desc describes a group of half a dozen Poles, Poles, standing around and laughing at the humiliation of the Jew. So when the Polish parliament gets up and says, as it has recently, that to say that the, Jew, that the Poles are implicated in the Holocaust, uh, is illegal because the Poles were victims of the Holocaust. I go back to Huberban's description of the cutting of the beard. There is a new category, right? We talk about per perpetrators, we talk about bystanders, uh, uh, we talk about upstanders. There's a new category because the greatest damage done beyond killing, the greatest damage done to those that made it was their humiliation. And there was a piece of European society that um, contributed to that humiliation. Uh, in Judaism, there is no sin like the sin of humiliating another person. It has no equal in severity. It's more serious than, it is more serious than murder in the hierarchy, if there is such a thing, of, of, of sins. The most serious sin in the whole Jewish tradition is humiliation. So this is a new category. It's a new category. And um, the humiliation, here, another example. Um, my mother, I have, I have, uh, my mother is so sick with, with typhus and every other disease known to humankind uh, that she is given up for dead. And she actually had a, uh, a cardboard tag with a wire connected to it that was connected to her that said, about to die. And she kept it for the rest of her life and was very proud of it. I always said, rumors of my, you know. <laughs> um, and so she was, um, she was out of it. Um, what was I going to tell you? Um, yes. So uh, I am uh, shipped off with a bunch of kids from Trobitz, taken to Leipzig by a truck um, of American soldiers that were in the area. The 321st uh, Trucking Division of uh, of the infantry, uh, a black African-American division. And those guys take a bunch of kids on a truck. And the deal was that these, every child will be re repatriated to, his, to the, his country of origin. So, and I, I talk about that in the book. It's not the main thrust of what I want to say now. But uh, um, I'm on a train from Leipzig to back to Holland. In Holland, because my mother was given up for dead, I am adopted by a Dutch family. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I wasn't adopted for long, probably four or five months, as best as I can calculate. Uh, very, I don't remember their faces, but I remember the feeling about them. But I do have a letter from the guy who adopted me to my mother. And from what he says in this letter, my mother was really nasty to him. Like, what are you doing with my kid? You know, this kind of thing. And, and get him to me, because with me, he'll get the right care. And whatever. And you can imagine how crazy she was uh, with the fear that she would never see me again, that they would keep me. This was not out of the question in those days in Holland. That, that it wasn't clear that the kid would go back to, uh, to the parent. And it, you know, if you ask me today, it wasn't always the smartest thing. But how can you not bring a kid back to his mother? So, OK. But she is nasty. It, I, I, we don't have her letter. We have his letter. And he's saying to her, you know, like, calm down, lady. I'm taking very good care. He's a wonderful boy. Um, <laughs> and, and we're taking very good care of him. And I'm trying to think, but why my mother is nasty to this family, who, after all, right, took me in, took care of me, and is not in any way giving them a hard time about giving me back. Of course you're going to give her back. But she's nasty to them. What's the answer? Pardon me? Humiliated. Totally humiliated. She's the largest, largest reason for anyone's humiliation is if you can't take care of your kid. And that's what the Nazis did to us. That's Rabbi, what the Nazis did to us. Rabbi, you, you wrote in, in, in your book that the 1950s were particularly difficult. And you were writing in the context of the Holocaust was not over at the end of World War II. Is this reflection on humiliation, is that a window into what was going on, that the humiliation continued for the people who had been victimized, targeted, treated in, um, in these ways, it's uh, in some sense it's a, a murder of the spirit uh, that is continuing. It, is is that part of what you were trying to to help us see that this victimization is was continuing? I think so. I think so. I th um, when when if the guy who 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 Rabbi Huberban saw his beard being cut so sharply that his skin was coming off with it. What I think he's going to remember after the war, should he have the, the, the uh, capacity to survive, what he's going to remember is not the pain of the scissor on his skin. He's going to remember the Polish laughter. And I don't know, I don't know, and I really don't know, that one can get over humiliation. And that legacy of humiliation is common to every survivor of the Holocaust. There ain't one that didn't have that. Because that's what they did to us. Uh, I, I, I took my sons last week uh, to Auschwitz, to the place that was Auschwitz. And the last place we visited there was a um, barracks in Birkenau that was for women, um, for women who were not um, physically capable of working, they were too slight or too old or whatever their, their, their work issue was. And they were put in this barracks 
waiting their turn for the gas. The barracks um, were uh, brick on the outside. Uh, there, there were three-tiered bunks on both sides and a path on the floor. There was no toilets. And they were not fed in the um, five to 10 days to two weeks that they spent in that barracks. And the floor was a dirt floor. It was not a finished floor. There was no basement. Some of the barracks in Auschwitz had, had cellars. Uh, this had no bait. It was a straight dirt floor with rocks jutting out of the floor. And I am thinking, uh, because I'm Dutch and I come from a country that, that where they're nuts about cleanliness, where these women come from their modern kitchens. We're talking, we're talking remember, uh, the 1940s. This is not the 1340s. Uh, where people have beautiful kitchens and beautiful dining rooms and where cleanliness is, is like the, the most important thing to them. And to have women like that without food, without toilets, lying substantially on dirt floors because there's not enough room on the bunks. And I'm saying, if anybody will survive this, and I don't think anybody actually survived that particular barracks. But if anybody will ever survive this, what they're going to remember is somewhat the hunger, somewhat the filth, but what they're going to remember most intensely is the humiliation. What's helped you address that? And I've chosen the word address as a way of talking about facing something that is, has the power to rob you of face, of self-respect. And as I read your work, as I'm coming to know you, um, there, there's a religious dimension of your identity that gives you a place from which to address this, the humiliation and to call it humiliation, to face it honestly. It doesn't necessarily it doesn't make it go away. It doesn't fix it. But it gives you a way to address it and find a, an, a wholeness that can encounter this destructive quality to it. What, it it's, another, it's a way of also asking in the midst of all that, where does the hope come from? You see, um, and I, I, I point to this in the book, if I am humiliated, while I'm saying Kaddish, just by the fact that there's nobody my age saying Kaddish, it's part of that humiliation. You ever see any kids saying Kaddish? No. Pollock has to say Kaddish. I don't want to say Kaddish. Get all the kids to say Kaddish. I'll be happy to say Kaddish also. So this, this humiliation, you see, this humiliation, as much as I experience, experienced it, and as much as um, 
My mother had her deep, deep shame. She never talked about the shame, but it was all over her. I mean, you know, Elie Wiesel, God bless his memory, never knew whether to cover his number or, or not to cover his number. Sometimes he pulled the sleeve down, sometimes he didn't. Don't underestimate this humiliation. And what I'm saying to you is, as a Jew, if I am humiliated as a six-year-old, and it's a humiliation that never leaves me, and that notwithstanding my greatest efforts, I have transferred it to my children. There are people now saying it's genetic. Maybe. Maybe. But if I, this child, doesn't know half of what happened to me, and I am the most humiliated person I ever met, then there is only one higher level of humiliation, and that is God. As the Jewish people are this humiliated, imagine, imagine. I am the Lord who took you out of the land of Egypt. God, I was six friggin' years old. Could you not, could you find some rabbi to say that he doesn't have to say cottage, it's too humiliating? No one, no one was more humiliated, I believe, than the Almighty. And now he has to live. He has to live with what he witnessed. You know, and we sing for the Messiah, and we ask for all this to end. And Eli used to say, without fail, if the Messiah comes, he will have come too late. He had his chance. So even the Messiah has been humiliated. <coughs> I don't agree with Ellie on this. I never did. But if I may um, use a, uh, uh, the phrase, I would not want to be in God's shoes after the Holocaust. Has your text study Torah Talmud, has, has it given you ways to address and deal with the humiliation that you've experienced, you know that others have experienced, and you understand that God, too, has, has known? Does, how, does the, how does the text study give you, how does it inform this journey? So I had a spectacular teacher in my teen years growing up in Montreal. His name was Rabbi Pinchas Hirschsprung, blessed memory. Uh, and I was given the privilege of studying with him a couple times a week, I would say from age 10 or 11 uh, until I was in college, up to and including my time in college. And he knew um, the Talmud by heart visually. 
the entire Talmud. He, I used to tease him that he had a photographic memory. He would throw things at me. He says, you're not giving me enough credit for the amount of study I do. Um, but he, he, and his method of pedagogy was rather unremarkable. He would say to me, Yossi, say the text. And I would say the text, and he would completely ignore me, unless I made a mistake. If I made a mistake, he would jump up and down and say, oh my god, did you just murder this text? Unbelievable. And that was the method of pedagogy. However, if I asked an insightful question about the material, he would ignite, and that's the only word I can find. He would ignite, he would jump up and down in joy, and he would say, finally, you asked a magnificent question. And when he said that, he invited me inside a different kind of fire. And a fire where I found the divine presence. And the Talmud itself says that if a Jew sits and studies the Torah, God is his chavrusa, the Almighty is his study partner. That no one studies the Torah when, without inviting God to be part of it, and God is part of it. And I had that spiritual experience. And that spiritual experience is with me every day and informs the things that I do and allows me to live with questions that get more difficult and more pressing as I study them, including questions about God. But at some point in the fire that is the Torah, Eish dat, fire that is the Torah, uh, God is never absent and God is fully accessible, and God is fully available, all you need to do is to find a study buddy and a text, and you're home free. And so I have never had doubts about God, and because I know that sooner or later I can find him in what scholars call the text. Uh, I'm a little wary of that phrase of the text because uh, the text, uh, let me just say that uh, the classical Torah text, the oral law, the, the, the um, written law, and uh, the spiritual uh, side of our tradition uh, has always allowed me uh, what you're calling spiritual recovery um, and uh, lets me be a husband and lets me be a father um, and uh, gives me a metaphor where for all the humiliation I can somehow negotiate the world. And, and the word partnership is part of that, isn't it? That there's a um, there's a an openness and a a joint venture, a joint um, opening of one to another that has a level of vulnerability in it that leads you to be able to say, you realize that there was divine humiliation, that God experienced that with his people. Right? Am I reading you accurately? Yeah, yeah. Um, That's not an all powerful, untouchable God. That's a God who has embraced creation and is woundable in some sense. It is 
woundable. Yeah. Yes. Yes, very much so. Very much so. Uh, it's a God that allows himself some vulnerability. Um, it is, you don't have to be a Bible scholar, clearly possible to offend him. Somebody who is all powerful and all majestic and all, you know, you can't offend such a person. Sorry about the person part, but um, you can't. And God can be offended. There are feelings there somehow. And, and we have to be very careful not to use that kind of language about God, but you have to say something. And uh, I, think, I think that, that he shared in the, vulner in, the, in the humiliation of every single Jew. He was humiliated. How could he not be? How could he not be? That the Germans were building a museum in Prague that would hold the last Torah in the world because there would be no more Jews to study the Torah. That was going to be the destiny of the Torah. How could he not be humiliated? That they were winning that game, that they were willing to forego military battles. They were willing to forego military battles and use the trains instead of sending soldiers to the front to send Jews to Auschwitz. How could he not be humiliated? How could he not be humiliated? How many children, listen to this, how many children lived in the Warsaw Ghetto at the beginning in uh, orphanages? You ready? 100,000 in an area about double or triple the size of the Boston Commons. 100,000, that's not a manageable number. Kids without parents, kids who are hungry. It's not imaginable, a, a manageable number. You can't take care of kids that way. Where are their parents? Where is humanity? It is correct when you ask where was God to say where was man. That is correct. But I think God was humiliated. Had to have been. Had to have been. But I can find him. I can find him every day. I can find him every day. He's not gone. I'm wondering if we're at a place where we can ask for questions from the audience. Yeah, we want to leave a little time for audience uh, participation. Um, I aim to uh, con conclude at uh, 9 o'clock, but we have uh, 15 minutes for a conversation. And there will be mic runners ready when you are. Good evening. I just wanted to comment on the after the Holocaust. As a child of survivors, I've done nothing but struggle with that aspect of the Holocaust to try to understand my mother, try to understand my father. And yet, they gave us life. They uh, raised us, college, yeshiva, and they did the best that they could. In reading the book, the chapter on percussion, so we go to the idea of hearing the Holocaust, is very, very powerful. At some point, I had to put it down, because it makes your heart race. The staccato of the words makes your heart race. The fear is palpable. Fast forward to 
my recent relationships with, uh, with Rabbi Pollock. And Rabbi Pollock has a beautiful voice. God has given him a beautiful voice. And I've heard him be a cantor. I've sang with him, I've sung with him. And all I would say, the after, is that the percussion of the Holocaust is now a beautiful melodic sound for all who know him. I don't know if there was a question involved in that <laughs> statement. No, it was just I was hoping to get a Thank you, wonderful. <laughs> Thank you both. This question is addressed to Rabbi Pollock. As a survivor, I'm assuming that you thought you would grow older into your aarp dumb, and all of this will be memory, and what can you say about that? We now live in a time where the echoes from that period are back. We have soft fascism in this country. We have attacks against Jews, murder of Jews, attacks and murders of non-white people for the same reason Jews have been attacked. And it doesn't seem as if we are allowed to now become respectable and responsible seniors and survivors. We now, once again, have to pick up a placard and relate the experience that you and others have had to what is going on today. If you are a person who speaks in schools, kids will ask you, in light of your experience, can you please say something about today? And it's responsible to not avoid answering that question. I'm curious how today resonates in light of, what was the phrase? After is not over. Jack, it's a profound and an important question, and we live in scary times. I spent most of my career trying to teach young people, and I continue to believe in them, and I continue to believe, most of all, that they're teachable, and that the lessons that they need to learn can be taught. And um, I just um, would like to say that I heard of the following activity that took place at a school in Germany, that the kids in the school made a project where they found, they researched and found out the names of the Jewish children that had been kicked out of the school in the 1930s because they were Jewish. And they posted those names in a prominent place in the school on a permanent marker so that everybody ever coming to the school could see what Germany was in those days, what that school was in those days. And I think that if, if we do, if, if there's a, 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 a doctor in Germany that has done that for one hospital that where all the Jewish doctors were thrown out in, in, in 37 or whenever it was. The, the, there's a, a beautiful uh, list of, there are things that we can do. There are things that we can do. We can teach people uh, as we are today about bullying. We can teach people, as we do today, about humiliation. We can teach people these things and tell them why it's not cool. And, and I, um, I'm simply incapable of despairing about the young. I think the young are beautiful and open and can listen in ways that us old guys have a much harder time doing. So, uh, uh, 
the, if there is a solution, the solution is in first class moral education. That would be my uh, response. Professor Knight, I know from our conversation earlier that you have thoughts about this subject as well. Can I invite you to comment as well? I have to deal with that question um, from the privileged side. Uh, I'm a child of the Deep South, in addition to being a Protestant clergy person. And it, it's terribly important for me never to lose sight of the fact that um, racism has been at the heart of a world I grew up in and know intimately well. And if, if I'm anything, I'm a recovering racist, trying to come to terms with ways in which it's still part of the way I, I look at the world, not something I want, but there, there are dimensions of how I see others that I need somebody else to tell me when I've gone into that bank of, of awareness or that bank of interpretation. And I've got to be vulnerable enough to listen. I've, I've got to be able to hear. That's equally true about the anti-Judaism that is part of my own religious tradition, even part of my own scriptures. I've got to be able to read with that kind of awareness and spot it where it is. Uh, I've, got, um, I, I've, I've got to wrestle with it in multiple dimensions uh, because I've been a child um, that's been part of the perpetration. Uh, and what I can do is not just be aware of it, I can teach from that base because there are plenty of others like me who haven't had somebody like me to talk to them about a world we share that's a problem or worlds in plural that we share that is a problem. And um, so I, I, have to, I have to wrestle with it from the, from the perpetrator side as well as the, um, the bystander side and um, be vulnerable enough to let my friends call me out. Somebody like Joe to say, no, you can't say that. And I've got to be able to demonstrate in full public view that I can manage the shame that uh, how do I how do I claim the shame without being ashamed? And, and let that be a source of strength. Um, thank you, Rabbi, for um, sharing with us all those deep feelings and thoughts. And I have a question I'm not really formed in my, I'm trying to figure out if God can be wounded, and I believe that we're all wounded, and I believe that after is not over, but if, if God can be wounded, can you speak a little bit more about what your life has taught you about God? Because I know when I go to sleep tonight, that's the thing I'm thinking about, the wound of God, and how do I conceptualize what God is if God, too, can be wounded? Thank you. That's all you want to know? Anything else? Uh... <laughs> Gee, what a piece of you know, cake. I mean, nothing to it. Uh, question.
clearly we need an amplified vocabulary about God after the Holocaust. Hashem, Hashem, Lord, Lord, Kel Rachum V'chanun, compassionate, caring, Erech Apayim, without anger, Rav Chesed, filled with Chesed, with loving kindness. Hello? Where do you, what do you want to talk about first? Auschwitz? Good starting point? Those vocabularies, those vocabularies, which we all understand and which we all appreciate. I mean, you know, I, somebody tells me they don't believe in God. I said, put your finger on your, uh, what's it called, your jugular. Is that the, the one that beats, what's it called? Carotid. Carotid. Carotid, yes. Put your hand on the carotid artery and tell me coincidence, right? <laughs> tell me chemistry, tell me science. Don't be ridiculous. You know, so on the one hand, on the one hand, how can we not be grateful? Um, there were worship services in Auschwitz. There were people who kept Jewish calendars in all the hell holes of the Third Reich. The new book on it by Alan Rosen, which you should all read. Jewish calendars during the Holocaust. Uh, th it is possible, even in those dark moments, to be grateful for the glory, to be grateful for, for and, and a guy like me who survived, I shouldn't be grateful? Come on. And so, you have to live with the questions if you don't keep the questions alive, questions about God that you're asking, if you don't keep those questions alive, I would argue that you are not a religious person. Because you're not facing the world that God created. Uh, but if you were to throw out the baby with the bathwater, uh, that's not a position that I find tenable either. And uh, um, I'm not happy with the answer he gave Job. I don't think anybody is. Um, but on the other hand, on the other hand, if Job were to ask him the, the questions that we have, his answers, I think, would be different. And they would have to do with weeping with us. We have time for one more question. Uh, as an alumni um, of BU and as an alumni of Hillel, there are two things I want to say. One is um, I continue to live at my age in the memory of Rabbi Pollock um, during high holidays. If any of you in the audience my age remembers this, your illustrious voice singing out the names of the concentration camps during um, Yes, and Kippur. Yes, um, the other thing that I want to share is I'm leaving this evening once again in uh, your presence of learning and, and needing to recognize for myself the distinctions between being ashamed, being embarrassed, and being humiliated, and how those um, intertwine. Thank you. I take that as a wonderful concluding statement. Um, let me just invite all of you back to our next two lectures, conversations on writing from a place of survival. On uh, October 28, we will have Sharon Portnoff, the Elie Wiesel Professor of Judaic Studies at Connecticut College, uh, who will speak on Primo Levi and how Primo Levi uses Dante's Inferno to give voice to his own experience. It, uh, uh, if you haven't heard uh, Sharon Portnoff, she's an extraordinary speaker. 
And on uh, November 18, we will have Luang Ang, who is a Cambodian American, who will speak to us on uh, the basis of her experience as a child survivor of the Pol Pot regime. She was pressed into the services of the regime as a child soldier at the age of five. And she's an extraordinary speaker and a very inspirational author. She's written two memoirs. And uh, the first book, First They Killed My Father, was turned into a film by uh, Angelina Jolie that she co-wrote with uh, Luang Ang. She will be here two days on campus meeting with students. There will be a chance also to see the film. Um, and on the 18th of November, she will be here in this place. Uh, and I hope you will come back for that. So I want to thank our two distinguished special guests tonight, uh, Robert Pollock and Professor Knight, for sharing very honest insights and uh, inspiring, found inspiring words for us to consider something that is clearly not easy to think about and or to speak about. And I'm extraordinarily grateful to both of you. So thank you very much. <laughs>